I have to admit, I always get a little bit weepy at this point because as I look out on your faces, I realize that this particular group will never be together again, that we have shared an experience together that we won't have the opportunity to do again, but a day is coming when we will be together. And I just want to kind of memorize some of your faces so that when I see you there, oh, I remember you, it was back in 2023. <laughs> Boy, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm 5'2". God made me 5'2", and I'm content. Ish. <laughs> well, this morning we want to talk about confident hope in that day. Because our next gathering will be on that day. We are surrounded by reasons to despair. And I really don't need to rehearse them, but I'll mention a few. We've just come through a global pandemic and they tell us the likelihood of something similar occurring in the future is greater than it has been in history. Wars and the threat of war, political disunity, widespread injustice, economic decline. And the truth is a rose tinted view of hope based in the belief that things are just gonna work out. It isn't enough. All over the world, people are desperately looking for hope. Now, someone said what oxygen is to the lungs, hope is to the human spirit. It buoys up our spirit. It lifts our vision from what is, what is to what will be. It's a candle in the darkness. It provides encouragement for the future. Hope is the one thing that lifts the human spirit and keeps us going through the daunting challenges that we face. Hope powerfully motivates us to look for the day after tomorrow. Now we know that Jesus is our hope. And for Christ followers, his return is our most cherished, blessed hope. Jesus' words in John chapter 14, verse 1, echo down the centuries, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, how can that resonate at a time when everything around us is troubling? Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Stop worrying. There's no need to be anxious. This world is not all there is. I am coming again. He is not from a remote location going to make everything right. He is coming in person. I am coming again. In more than 1,500 places in the Bible, it speaks about the return of Christ. And it emphasized more than 25 verses in the New Testament. And for every prophecy about the first coming of Christ in the Old Testament, there are eight highlight, highlights um, highlighting the second coming of Jesus. It is throughout Scripture from beginning to end. The hope of seeing the risen Lord face to face. It fueled the endurance for Jesus' disciples through persecution and ministry frustrations. But for many of us, we may have lost sight of this blessed hope and the certainty of our rescue from this world of sin. This morning, we're going to tap into the apostles' longing to simply be in the presence of Christ without getting entangled into date setting or disagreements. I want to foster a new, fresh hope that will drive our daily responses to temptation and affliction, to discouragement and life in a broken world, because Jesus is coming again. Martin Luther said, there are only two days on my calendar. There's today and that day. During a recent period of serious illness, I found myself alone on my couch uttering the words, I'd like to go to Fiji. There was no one in the room. I'd never thought about Fiji. I don't know where it came from. I just said it out loud. There was just me and Jesus. I'd like to go to Fiji. I couldn't even point to it on a map, but I said out loud, I'd like to go to Fiji. <laughs> At that time, I could hardly get up off the couch. I had been in the hospital for a number of days, in a coma for five days. Uh, my diagnosis was uncertain, and I just said, I want to go to Fiji. Can't get up and go to the bathroom, but I want to go to Fiji. <laughs> Now, the chances of my actually going to Fiji were uh, about the same as it would be for me running and for president and winning, to put it into perspective. 
Well, in my fraught situation, a trip to Fiji took on grand proportions. It felt like a finish line, a refuge. For months, my goal was to make it to that day when I would board a plane to Fiji and everything would be made right. Well, now the chances, again, of my going were slim to none, but I actually ended up going to Fiji. That's a whole other story. I was sitting in Deborah Greenwich's church. Uh, my husband was playing drums with the worship team, and she just sauntered up next to me and said, would you like to go to Fiji? <laughs> what? We'd never had a conversation about it. I never mentioned to her anything about a desire to go to Fiji. And I just had to laugh because I thought the Lord took my little utterance, my foolishness, that I just said out loud to him alone, and he orchestrated the whole thing. I went to Fiji. <laughs> wow. I went to Fiji with Deborah. I went to Fiji with Kamaria. And I went to Fiji with Karen. Oh, what a trip. Now, my guess is you have a that day that has taken on monumental force in your life. You might reason I can make it through today because a day in the future is coming that will resolve everything. Maybe for you, it's the end of the semester or the promotion, the wedding day, the kids moving out of the house, retirement or whatever looms large over your season of life. That's when everything will change on that day. Whew, that day is coming. When my trip to Fiji finally arrived, we launched out from Portland. And I cannot tell you how excited I was. I had great expectation and high hopes. There was, however, one thing I had failed to factor in, and that was that after that, day, that trip to Fiji, I would return home. <laughs> that day and those days would be followed by a return to the very things I hoped that I would escape. Seventeen days away were wonderful. They were marvelous. They were spectacular. I remember uh, going into the pool, and they kind of had to coax me into the pool because I'm not a water person. My brother drowned, and I just am afraid of deep water. They coaxed me into the pool, and after a while, I started feeling kind of comfortable in my bathing suit, which was more like a gym outfit because it, you know, 1920s outfit covering from knees. <laughs> and I started thinking, you know, I saw all these other young people swimming around me, and I thought, I probably look just like they do. And I remember walking up the side of the pool. You know, there's that ladder that gets you out of the water. I came up out of the pool and my hair was braided and long and I shook my head. I felt like Bo Derrick. <laughs> I was sure I was looking good in my swimsuit. And then Karen, who's kind of a historian, she took a picture. And I thought, oh, wonderful. Karen took a picture and then she showed me the picture. I look more like Bo Diddley than Bo Dare. <laughs> I was so disappointed. <laughs> I have carefully put that swimsuit away, and uh, <laughs> I prefer to just imagine what I must have looked like. I found myself staying in the water longer, that little trip out of the water. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. Oh, how I still long for that day. Now, few of us anticipated how radically the pandemic would upend our lives. What started as a curious news story in the early part of the early months of 2020 brought life as we knew it to a screeching halt. And by the end of the year, the sentiments of good riddance were universal. Out with 2020, bring in 2021. Now, in retrospect, the changing of the calendar year it shouldn't have held such outsized promise in our minds, but what we had been through led us to that conclusion. That didn't stop us from feeling a breathless anticipation for what this new year would bring. Those hopes were dashed when very little changed, and by the end of 2021, the spike in the Omicron variant of COVID led to a much more sober expectation for the year to come. Many dubbed the new year 2022. Well, this is frequently the outcome of our short-term hopes. The glossy brochures of an upgraded future that we imagine rarely match the reality of what actually happens. That day either falls short, it falls flat, or it doesn't arrive at all. But what if our instinct isn't wrong? What if there is a day that will change everything? Now, what if there is an event that doesn't merely appear in the distant future, but is massive enough to alter how we live right now? What if, as the great hymn, Great as Thy Faithfulness, suggests, there is bright hope for tomorrow that can give us strength for today? 
Now, we're all going to drive away from here, and the fumes of what we've heard and the time of fellowship we've enjoyed together, they will dissipate. And unless we are intentional, Lord, what did you say to me? I want to write it down. I want to rehearse it in my mind. It will just become a faint memory. But what if, as the great hymn says, that there is a day, there is an event coming that will so etch itself in our minds that it will change everything about today. I want to invite you to recover or perhaps discover what the Bible has to say about that day. Now, the Old Testament calls that day the day of Yahweh. The New Testament, the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. It was a day that the angels spoke of at Jesus' ascension when they said, he will come in the same way which you saw him go into heaven in Acts 1, 11. It is the day when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. It is the day when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Don't you long to just see them? Yes. To be marveled at among all who have believed. It is the day when Jesus appears and we shall see him as he is. Not those paintings that you see hanging up that, you know, have the long-haired guy. Jesus as he is. This is the ultimate that day. The day when Jesus returns. And anticipating that day can transform how we live today. In 1 Peter 1.13, the apostle commands the church to hope fully on all the grace we have experienced when Jesus is revealed. Now, what the Bible says about Jesus' return is not to crack a secret code or connect current events with biblical prophecy, but to hope fully, to live with a radical orientation around the moment we will see Jesus face to face. We hope fully when anticipation of his coming transforms how we live right now, today, in this moment. Now, for most believers... Rather than hopefully, our posture is often better described as, well, hopefully. We don't deny Jesus' promise to return and make all things right, but we live as though it were, well, just a distant, faint possibility. After all, the political forecast is bleak, the economy tanking, leadership is lacking, so it's easy to see how we simply keep it so far away intellectually and emotionally that it does very little to shape how we live right now. Now, the word hopefully is what we use when discussing faint, distant wishes, as in hopefully the lawmakers in Washington will. <sighs> will transcend partisan gridlock. So much more could be said, but oh, Lord Jesus, help us. Hopefully my team will win the Super Bowl. Or for those under 50, hopefully Social Security will still be around when I retire, if I ever in this lifetime retire. I may hope it happens, but I'm not actually banking on it. It doesn't really impact how I live today. That kind of indifferent shrug toward Jesus coming will do nothing to change how we live in the way the New Testament authors expected that it would. That hopeful anticipation. Their call is for us to hope fully and the return of Christ. When our hope transforms how we live today, that's what it means to hope fully. As John wrote, those who hope in Jesus appearing purify themselves even as he is pure in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And according to Paul, waiting for our blessed hope trains us to renounce ungodliness to, and worldliness, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in present age. If you need some help in this area, and by the way, that's Titus, second chapter, verse 12. If you need some help in, uh, in saying no to the world and what it has to offer, hope fully to the coming of Christ. So how do we hope fully in Jesus appearing? Well, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour of his appearing. It's always best to look to the scriptures, and aren't you grateful for God's word? I hope, I hope that you are spending time in God's word. It's his love letter to us. It's instruction manual. He teaches and instructs us and, and reproves us and guides us. And what a tremendous treasure we have. And I fear that far too few of us spend quality time in his word. I'm hoping that we will be the exception. Well, in the Pauline epistles, we see how anticipating Jesus' return gave strength for the day's assignment in the life of the apostle Paul. 
two of his earliest letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, they're permeated with references to Jesus coming. In the 10 years between 1st Thessalonians and Philippians, Paul experienced many of the persecutions and near-death events that we read about that are recorded in the later chapter of Acts. He had endured beatings and stonings, shipwrecks, imprisonments, and the incitement of more than one riot. All the while, Jesus is still in heaven, and Paul is still on earth, suffering for his sake. Now, when you read the book of Philippians, written as Paul awaited trial in jail, you hear a shift in Paul's tone. In Philippians 1, he grapples with the fact that he may be executed and consequently see Jesus in heaven before his return. Yet that doesn't stop Paul from writing in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That day is coming. Jesus is coming. Now, Paul awaited the Savior's return, regardless of his situation, to give him strength for the day. Well, by the time Paul wrote his final letter, death was no longer a possibility, but an imminent inevitability. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he declared his famous valedictory, his farewell address. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In his final season of life, he highlights and he, his sights remain set on the coming of his Savior as he anticipates receiving the crown of life. <laughs> the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Don't settle for a tiara. There is a crown of life that he himself has fashioned to fit on your head just right. Now, my guess is we're not going to wear that crown very long because seeing him in his holiness, we will snatch that thing from our head, recognizing that any righteousness we might have was given to us by Jesus himself, and we will lay it at his feet where it belongs. And in humility, if we can get up at all, we will rise to worship him. To the death, Paul loved Jesus appearing. He could approach his death with such confidence because his hope had propelled him to a faithful life with and for Jesus. Now, this kind of hope can fuel your life and ministry as well. If you find yourself feeling impatient with immature believers, if you feel the brokenness of this world in your body, if you face afflictions because of your stand for Christ, Paul serves as a model for us, a model of how a full hope in Jesus' return can fuel your perseverance through difficulties. Even if Jesus comes back the day after you die, your yearning to see him face to face right now can give you the long strides needed for faithfulness to the end. Now, this hope has carried believers for generations. Christ returns appears not only in the final chapters of our systematic theologies, but also in the final verses of some of our cherished hymns. Horatio Spafford, he penned a song that you are probably familiar with, It Is Well With My Soul, one of the greatest hymns of the 19th century. While mourning the death of all of his children after their ship sank in the Atlantic Ocean, the hymn's final verse hopes in the coming of Jesus that will make all things well and life possible moving forward. And Lord, haste the day, he writes, when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Likewise, one of the greatest hymns of the 20th century, How Great Thou Art. It locates the greatness of God now, not only in his works, in the works of God's hand in creation and the outpouring of God's love at the cross, but in the majesty of Christ's coming. The contemporary worship song, In Christ Alone, in a similar way, with a hopeful look at seeing Jesus at the believer's death or the Savior's return, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. 
No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. Great is thy faithfulness doesn't explicitly reference the appearing of Christ, but broadly points to God's past faithfulness in Christ's death, his present faithfulness in the Spirit's indwelling, and his sure and certain faithfulness in the future. With an implied expectation of Jesus' return, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Hymns like these have shepherded millions of believers through difficult times with the steady hope of Christ's return in power and in glory. Songs of hope in Jesus' coming also carried enslaved people, my forebears, as they labored in the fields in the American South. In that great getting up morning, in that great getting up morning, fare you well, fare you well. In that great getting up morning, fare you well, fare you well. It gave those oppressive, <laughs> it gave those oppressive uh, working in the fields from which there was no relief, who were seeking justice at that day to anticipate the coming of the Savior. On that day, they would bid an excited, fare ye well, fare ye well. To a world that had given them sorrow and loss, they sang to call individuals to let Christ's return compel them to get themselves ready. They looked for judgment and final justice that day when Christ would appear. Now, this longing for both personal and personal holiness and corporate justice, it captures the robust effect of Jesus appearing. It's meant to have throughout the New Testament in the letters, whether spiritual hymns or contemporary worship songs, we find strength for today when we sing our hope. A church filled with believers eager to see the Lord will be a church of radical obedience, bold gospel proclamation, and increasing holiness. So may this be our cry. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, my prayer is that God will stir up new and fresh affection for the coming of the Savior, fresh waves of joy and love and a longing for Jesus in our hearts. God's word teaches that the appearing of Jesus Christ in his resurrected glory is the Christian's blessed hope. In, first, in Titus, rather, chapter 2, verse 13. Our hope is not vague, wishful thinking. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Our hope is, is not unfounded optimism. Our hope is Jesus and what he will accomplish when he returns. Yet so often, this hope in Jesus and his return feels faint and distant, even irrelevant to our daily lives. It's like a star in the night sky that accessorizes the view, but 25 light years away, it exerts no gravitational pull on us. If Jesus' return has no gravitational force in your life, then something else will. It could be the flashy promise of money, or sex, or power, influence, or beauty, with its dividends, which is feed, fleeting and fading, as we discussed yesterday. Or it could be the allurement of a normal, undisrupted life. Just leave me alone. I will just wait till Jesus comes. I won't say a word. Just. But as Christian women, our life aim is to fix our hope fully on Jesus. Not merely the final events on an end times chart, but the person of Jesus. We draw near to him today in hope of the full face-to-face -face encounter when he returns. When Jesus returns, he will return as the lover of our soul, the bridegroom returning for the bride, the resurrecting one who makes all things new. He will also return as the conquering king and the righteous judge. When we anticipate Jesus' return, we stand in the same stream of hope that carried Isaiah and Jeremiah and Joel and Amos through times of idolatry and injustice. We connect to something as ancient as it is potent, the promise that God will repair what has been broken in person. The New Testament contains at least 25 references to this day when Jesus will return to bring this about with details that are no less epic than what the prophets foretold. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. 
A life focused on this final day transforms how we live today. We can resist the passing allurements of the age as we anticipate the superior satisfaction of experiencing the divine manifestation that is coming. We have a foretaste, the indwelling spirit of Christ within us. We know that he has prepared a place for us. He said, if you hadn't done so, he would have told us. He sits now at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for us. And when we can't even give utterance to our heart's desire, his spirit interprets our groanings and speaks to the Father in a way that clarifies precisely what you need. A life focused on that final day transforms how we live. We can view present afflictions against the backdrop of this final reckoning, knowing that no one has the power over our final destiny but Jesus. And we can warn those still under Jesus' wrath to trust in him before it's too late, that they might experience the day of the Lord with delight and not with dread. When we practice rest now, looking toward the author and finisher of, our, finisher of our faith who is coming, what great delights we can experience. Let me remind you that the Apostle Paul's encouraging and holistic prayer and promise in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. It's not an if proposition. I hope I can just hold out until he will surely do it. Over the dull roar of social media likes and ceaseless cable news, Jesus will come. The shout will be so loud and authoritative that the dead will hear it. An hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live, John 5, 25. I want to see my daddy. I want to see my brother. I want to see my grandma Lee on that great getting up morning. This is the epic moment, great enough to capture your imagination and carry you in hope for the duration of your days. It will have all the fanfare of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 with loud voice and trumpet blast. It will carry all the trembling and awe of the divine manifestation when the people wondered whether they would survive the encounter. On that day, Jesus will return. Evil will be destroyed. Righteousness will reign forever. Sin, sickness, and suffering will be no more. Disease, disaster, and death will be vanquished. Wickedness, war, and worry will vanish. The Apostle Paul calls this glorious event our blessed hope. Jesus Christ will return. Death will not have the last word. One day on that day, our loved ones who died believing and living for Christ. Hmm. Whew, don't get me happy out here. <laughs> will, will be resurrected from their graves to see him face to face. One day soon, the hopes of all of the ages will be realized. And we who are alive to witness this spectacular, glorious event will be caught up to meet him in the air. We will travel with him on the most amazing space journey to the most amazing place in the universe to live with him throughout eternity. We need not worry about the future. We don't have to let fear grip our hearts or strangle our joy. Christ has created us. Christ has redeemed us. Christ cares for us. Christ sustains us. And Christ is coming again to take us home. Now that, now that is something to be hopeful about. The hope toward which we lean, the hope that transform your days, is centered on the simple promise, and so we will always be with the Lord. Jesus is our hope. His presence is our reward. And by the Spirit, we taste this hope now. And on that final day, we will luxuriate 
in his presence forever. Encourage one another with these words on a normal Tuesday morning and an exhausted Thursday afternoon and a leisurely Saturday afternoon. Encourage one another in the place where you might least expect the reality of Jesus' return to shape your life because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It will be worth it all someday. It will be worth it to go the straight and narrow way when we finally see his face and we feel his warm embrace. It will have been worth it all that day. These present troubles don't compare to all the glory our God, he has prepared. Cause when we finally see his face, when we feel his strong embrace, it will have been worth it all that day. I can see the angels celebrate as he calls my name. And I can hear the Father say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, well done. It will be worth it all. It will have been worth it all that day. Jesus is coming. Hmm. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we lift up an applause to you, Lord God, for your goodness and your faithfulness and your mercy for the truth of your word, for the confident hope we have knowing that you are coming again, that you will set things right in person. We bless your name. Lord, help us to remember. Lord, help us to be motivated, to be inspired and encouraged, to sing our hope, Lord Jesus, and to remember that we will see you face to face one day, and it will be worth it all. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask these things in your precious name, the name above every other name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.